Good evening. I'm Jenny Ayat from the um, Community Relations and Marketing Department here at the Ann Arbor District Library. On behalf of the library, I'd like to welcome all of you here this evening. And I would like to also thank and welcome our co-sponsors, A2 Ethics and IPPA, as well as our author speakers this evening. Thank you all for being here. I have one quick little announcement, and that would be, if you have a cell phone, if you could please put it on silent mode right now, we would appreciate that. I'm going to introduce our first speaker for this evening, Janine DeLay of A2 Ethics. Hello, can everyone hear me? Good evening, uh, thank you so much for coming. Uh, I am Janine Delay. I'm the president of A2 Ethics, the co-sponsor of this evening's program, with, along with the Interfaith uh, Partnership for Political Action, or IPPA. We wish to thank our hosts, uh, Jenny Ayat and Tom Smith uh, of the Ann Arbor District Library, and the Literati Bookstore for making available the books written by our speakers, uh, Bob uh, Monks and Jeff Clements. Uh, which we're showcasing this evening. I have three very delightful tasks, probably the best tasks of the evening. And the first is just to mention to you that tomorrow uh, we are having a follow-on event uh, to this program uh, at the downtown library from 12 uh, to 2 p.m. in the multi-purpose room. Uh, this is a panel discussion. The format is different. Uh, Bob Monks and IPPA members Don Monroe and Bob O'Neill are going to be taking a different um, look at local corporations and we're going to look at uh, corporate behavior and corporate power uh, by looking at some local corporations and we're going to ask the question why is it that the Supreme Court uh, decided to give more power to corporations through decisions like Citizens United given some of the impact on communities, our home community uh, in particular, uh, and their actions and, and how, how uh, sometimes they're quite harmful. Uh, so please join us tomorrow, 12 to 2 p.m., uh, a different kind of program. My second assignment is to introduce the exhibit uh, in the back. Uh, this is a true ethics um, contribution to this program. It's an overview of several of the topics we're going to cover tonight from the legal doctrine of corporate personhood to ways in which uh, we as citizens can take action uh, and talk back uh, about these particular issues. Uh, and if you look at Teddy Roosevelt back there, he's the tour guide. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt had a lot to say about the dangers of political activity in corporations that are quite prescient and still haunt us. Uh, so please feel free to have a picture with Teddy, take a selfie, uh, because I think that, that you'll find looking at this exhibit is, is quite worth your while. Likewise, we have several handouts uh, here up here, so before you go, make sure that you pick up uh, these handouts, the resources, the ways to get involved, uh, ways to, to uh, get informed about the issues that we're talking about tonight. Finally, I'm really, really pleased. And I always love to acknowledge the very talented and devoted individuals who have contributed to this particular event. So I'm first going to um, recognize Stephanie Philbrick from Bob Monk's organization. Stephanie, who helped publicize this event. So thank you very much. Uh, and for the, uh, let's see, I can't find Linda. Linda Fitzgerald, um, if you can stand up. Uh, she is one of the people who helped to design uh, the exhibit. Steve Maggio was the graphic designer. And then our artist, Dusty Upton, all right, yeah. who gave us that very iconic and wonderful image of the person who incorporated. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'd also like to recognize the members of the Eighth Ethics Board who are here Martha Bloom, Jennifer Conlon. Erin Matamo, I saw sneak in there. A2 Ethics, for those of you who don't know, is a local uh, nonprofit uh, organization. We're five years old. And what we do is we promote ethics related uh, uh, programs and imaginative events 
Among them, the exhibit you see back here. Probably our signature event is the Big Ethical Question Slam, which is held every year at Connor's, Connor O'Neill's. It's an annual community event. And more recently, we started the Michigan High School Ethics Hall uh, for high school students interested in philosophy. Um, <coughs> we created this exhibit, A2 Ethics, but without our help of the, the two principals in uh, I, IPPA, we would not have had this event this evening. Uh, I want to recognize the members of the Interface Partnership for Political Action, and I need to give you a full, few words about this, pro, uh, this particular group. Uh, they are a local political discussion and policy study group, and I think that the best way to describe the mission of this group is to talk about Don Monroe and Bob O'Neill. And to be sure, I could spend an evening talking about their distinguished uh, academic careers and their accomplishments, but I think that tonight, simply, I would like to recognize um, their long-standing commitment to justice and democratic participation, their intellectual curiosity, and their willingness to take on one of the central aspects or roles of citizenship, which is, and this is exactly what we're doing this evening, to, take, to care about an issue and using their standard, its impact on human moral values and the planet, and then becoming informed about this issue and educated about it, presenting their views to, to elected officials, and finally encouraging other citizens to do so. The genesis and organization of this program uh, really represents a mix of engaged, this engaged view of citizenship with a bit of the old film classic, Babes in Arms, starring Mickey Rooney and Judy Garland, who, along with their friends, just, uh, were told that they couldn't be in the local play because they weren't part of the establishment and they had no experience. So Judy says to Mickey, or Mickey says to Judy, hey kids, let's put on our own show right here. <laughs> so that's what we have done, okay? This event and this exhibit started with a book reading uh, and a discussion of Bob Monk's uh, book, Citizens Disunited, at Bob and Neil's house. Some of the people who were uh, involved in that, I've seen them this evening. So like many grassroots initiatives, we hope that our program inspires you to put on your own show. So now I'd like to turn it over to Don Monroe, who's going to introduce our speakers. Well, I'm going to uh, say a few words about the procedure this evening. Uh, after a few comments of an introductory nature that I will make, we'll have uh, a 20-minute talk by Jeffrey Clements first, and uh, then Robert A.G. Monks, or Bob Monks, second. Uh, please do not ask questions during the speech. Uh, wait till the end of the speech, wait till the end of the talk to do so. There will be a Q&A after each, uh, respectively, after each 20-minute talk. Uh, and uh, I'm sure many of you have been at talks when uh, somebody gets up and rather than asking a question, uh, starts to pontificate. Uh, please ask a question uh, rather than pontificating. Um, and when you, uh, when the Q&A comes, we ask the questioner to come up to the microphone, which will be right there, right in the middle of the aisle. Um, at the, yes, the, the first speaker will be uh, Jeffrey Clements, who is the author of a book, uh, Corporations Are Not People. He's the co-founder of an organization called Free Speech for People, in contrast to Free Speech for Corporations. Uh, this is a national and nonpartisan group, uh, one of the goals of which is to um, eventually uh, try to have a constitutional amendment, number 28, uh, passed, which would uh, revoke, in essence, the Citizens United decision of the Supreme Court. I think most of us recognize that that's a very distant goal. <coughs> 
and that there are a lot of intermediate goals that can be achieved on the way to that, uh, even when the major goal is not uh, achieved. So some of the things that uh, Jeff Clements will speak about is what can we do, what can I do. Uh, then when he is through, uh, Mr. Monks will speak, and at the very end of the session I will pick up again the theme, what can I do, what can we all do, uh, of a concrete nature in the short term and in the long term. So now I'd like to uh, turn things over to Jeff Clements, uh, who will go up to the podium. Great, thank you, Don. Um, my eyes are not what they used to be, so I don't know if this is on. Is this on? No. Let me try this way. How about now? No. No. Well, maybe I don't. No. Okay. There you go. Um, uh, thank you, Don. Thank you all for having me here to Ann Arbor, um, which I've long looked forward to being in. I, um, I've been all over the country these last couple of years, um, and I realized coming out here that I had not yet been to Michigan, so I'm sorry about that. Uh, this is, I think, state number 28. Uh, so 28 states for the 28th Amendment. Um, so I, what I'd like to do in my 20 minutes before uh, uh, hearing some questions, and I hope we'll have some in some conversation, because I know uh, you're here because you have your thoughts and um, ideas about this, and Meetings like this are happening all over the country. Uh, you're not alone. Um, and uh, the 28th Amendment, which I will talk about in a second, I think is actually a lot closer than many people realize. Um, and that we're going to get this done. So what I'd like to do is talk about why I think that. But first, why um, we need to do it. Um, what are the stakes? Why, why not just get disclosure or get transparency or get some other method of reform, all of which are very good ideas and we work hard to get, why isn't that enough now? Um, so that's what I'd like to start with. But before I do, um, Michigan has been in the front line of what, uh, you may not have realized this, uh, m most of us didn't realize, we were all in the front line of a constitutional struggle, a struggle over who uh, we are as Americans, a struggle over what the Constitution uh, means, and particularly a struggle over two fundamental American propositions about our Constitution and our, our self-government uh, that we set out to try to achieve uh, over two centuries ago. One is that we're all equal. Uh, not every day, of course, not in our, or in our incomes or material goods, but we're all equal in the way uh, that we're all equal as human beings. We're all equal in the way that uh, Thomas Jefferson meant when he wrote the Declaration of Independence, that we're all created equal. And the one place that it has always been a constitutional principle that must be enforced is at election time and in self-government, because that's what a republic and a democracy is. Um, that's why we have one person, one vote. It's why we've had this long struggle to get closer to defending that idea. We've lost that. That's, that is what Citizens United means. We are not equal, and the Supreme Court says that's not an American value anymore, that we are not permitted to defend or enact even election laws or other laws based on the idea of political equality. The Supreme Court says, no, can't do that. And I'll talk a bit more about why they say that in a second. But the other fundamental proposition, of course, um, is that it's we the people. And the word people actually means something, human <coughs> beings. It's not we the corporations. And it's always been the case. We've always had to struggle in America. Corporations are excellent devices, they're property, they're lots of things, but they're not among we the people that the Constitution is about. And I'm so glad to be here with Bob Monks, who, uh, who has carried this message for most of his life about making corporations really what they are, which is more uh, effective in the economic sphere without corrupting and destroying the political sphere. Um, and so, uh, you know, if you haven't read Citizens Disunited yet, read Bob's book. It is just a, a powerful statement, not only about what is wrong, but about the moral value uh, behind what we are trying to do, all of us together in America, to restore a human rights-based republic. 
Um, so those are the two propositions. And we've had this, it's an old struggle. Um, and what Citizens United, the decision when the Supreme Court struck down the McCain-Feingold Law, Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act, struck it down, overturned a century of law that said corporations and unions cannot, if we want to enact a law, a law that says no election spending by corporations and unions, we can do that, overturned that and said no, we can't. Um, and so uh, what that case uh, stands for, and then the most more recent McCutcheon case, does, it, does everyone know the McCutcheon case? I, I, I want to say a few words about it in a second, uh, because um, the two cases together are the end game of this struggle that we didn't realize we were in. Uh, and now we know. And now we know we've lost if we don't overturn those cases. Um, and I say we know because uh, I'll talk a bit about the consequences of that, but you have to understand how intentional this is. This is not an accidental, whoops, we made a mistake. We accidentally gave corporations rights, and now, now they're spending billions of dollars, and we, the people, don't have a voice anymore. No, it, it's a, it's a, it's an end game of a plan, and uh, an ideology, really. And I don't want to make my argument for it. Let me share some uh, views of people who are sober, serious people, using terms like oligarchy plutocracy to describe our system. One of them is Representative Jim Leach from Iowa, 30-year con congressman, Republican, who gave a speech at Cambridge, uh, Massachusetts, not long ago, that said Citizens United, he compared it to the Dred Scott decision, said it's tipping America over into oligarchy. And he meant that as a defined term, government of the few, it's oligarchy. Bill Moyers, who did the foreword to my book, has used uh, plutocracy to describe it. And again, he means the real meaning of plutocracy, government of the wealth. Um, if you have uh, not followed the, um, the work of Justice Stevens since he retired from the court, I urge you, you can't miss him. He's everywhere. At 94 years old, uh, I was in, at UCLA two nights ago, um, and I was going to talk about what Justice Stevens did. First, you, you may know, he wrote a 90-page dissent in Citizens United that sounded the alarm, that outlined the stakes, and then when he <laughs> left the court, he just kept going. So he's written a book, it's called Six Amendments. He endorses the 28th Amendment to overturn Citizens United. Um, he has continually criticized the Roberts Court for what's it, what it's doing. But when I was getting ready to talk at UCLA, I was, um, had a New Yorker that I grabbed, took on the plane with me, and lo and behold, there's an interview of Je Jeffrey Tubin with Justice Stevens in the New Yorker this week, and Stevens at 94 tells Tubin, "Don't say I still play tennis. I haven't played in at least a month." <laughs> so, so he is not going anywhere. Tomorrow, I believe it is, he's going to be testifying in the Senate under, about dark money. Um, again, he is not a radical who uses uh, words uh, loosely, this is a Republican from Chicago before he went on the court, um, and, and he is saying we are in trouble. And he distilled his 90-page dissent down to it's really wrong. It's really wrong that people don't have a voice anymore. Um, and so finally my last sort of data point of it's not just Bob and I talking like this, it's, uh, and you probably know this, so I don't have to do it, but just so you know, you may have seen the recent study out of uh, Northwestern and Princeton. Um, April 9th, it came out. These are political scientists looking at the data. They said the United States cannot be described as a democracy based on the data. Um, and that's really sad. Uh, they, they said that the ordinary citizen, whether individually or even in mass groups, has a near zero, statistical, near zero independent effect on government policy, that there are preferences. Near zero, where business interests like the Chamber of Commerce and the extremely wealthy have a high independent effect on what government policy is. So the, when I started, I said, you know, this is intentional. So these are descriptions of what we look like to observers. Um, but when that study came out, the Manhattan Institute, which is one of those groups funded by the Koch brothers and big corporations to churn out 
um, you know, ideas that corporations are the same as people and so forth, said there's no news in this study that wealthy people are better informed and vote more often and that they will represent the middle class just fine. So that translated is oligarchs, that we have a description of a situation and they're saying, yeah, so what? That's how it should be. Um, and that's true in the briefs in the McCutcheon case. The McCutcheon case involved a CEO of a coal uh, industry engineering firm who complained because he couldn't give more than $123,000 a year to politicians' campaigns and said under Citizens United it violates the, the free speech rights of him. I won't ask for a show of hands or put people on the spot of who's been waiting to go beyond the 123000 in your annual contributions to politicians, but you can now. The Supreme Court struck down that limit. And the uh, Chief Justice Roberts wrote the decision, another 5-4 to four one. Justice Breyer wrote a great dissent saying that this, with Citizens United, the last remnant of a campaign um, regulation that is the only thing between us and the, the crisis of democratic legitimacy is now gone. Democratic legitimacy, you're talking, this is the su a Supreme Court justice ready for four, essentially saying, uh, again, oligarchy, plutocracy, fall of democracy. Um, so those are the stakes, but if you read the briefs in McCutcheon, they made the argument that one, and that was the campaign finance laws may not be based on, the, on, a, on an effort to ensure that people of wealth disparities are able to exercise their First Amendment rights or participate in, the, in our political system. Um, they essentially argued that it is illegal under Citizens United to try to have a law that will enable people of different means to participate politically and to exercise their own free speech rights. That argument won. That argument won. Uh, that basically, that again, the rich govern, they should govern. Corporations govern, they should govern. That's the way it is. So those are the stakes. It's what our Constitution and we stand for as Americans. The consequences, I think you know too well, but I'll touch on those as well. Um, and I say that because 95% of Americans think that the system is utterly corrupt and broken. Um, Sadly, 91% think there's nothing we can do about it. I'm going to get to that in a second and show that's not the case. But the consequences, as we know, $7 billion election, maybe $10 billion in 2012, 3,000 donors did all the super PAC funding. So 3,000 in our country, that's 0.001, I think. It's probably better math people. But it's a tiny fraction of 1% did all the super PAC spending. There's a donor class that's openly talked about. It's about 0.5%. The politicians know who they are. And that is why we see the effects, the environmental energy breakdown, the inability to govern. Chevron gave $2.5 million to the House Speaker super PAC. If you're wondering why we don't talk about ending oil and get coal subsidies, subsidies, mind you, if uh, we don't talk about the climate catastrophe, it won't happen in this house because the, the Chevron is funded the Speaker's super PAC. Chevron funded a council race in a city of 100,000 people in Richmond, Virginia. This is not just federal, this is coming to you. Um, it, it's Richmond, Virginia, they have a refinery, it exploded in August before the election. Chevron had a problem with the city councilors who weren't happy about 15,000 residents going to hospitals because of the toxic plume. Uh, Chevron could have fixed the problem or they could have fixed the council. They chose the latter and spent $1.2 million in the election. I talked to the mayor of uh, Richmond. She says they're spending over $2 million this next election. Um, so we are seeing around us the effects of what I think are Republican breakdown, Democratic, small d, small r, breakdown of a republic, breakdown of a democracy. These are symptoms of that problem, not the cause. The cause is we have lost the ability to do what Americans can do, which is correct, using the democratic process. Not partisan, not one policy or another, but, but a, a sort of you know, dynamic of democracy that is the best way in the long run to govern, and we are losing it. So I talk in my book about final problem, and I can see everybody getting glummer and glummer, and 
and it's, uh, <laughs> it's going to be uh, joy in a moment, though. Just bear with me. But the problem is even worse, though, because it's a constitutional struggle. It's about what that human rights charter, that protector of democracy, stands for. It's more than money in politics. It's not even just campaign finance reform. And in my book, I go back to Lewis Powell, um, who was a lawyer for the Chamber of Commerce and the tobacco industry uh, before he went on the Supreme Court in 1971. And before he went on the court, he had done a secret memo, nobody knew about it at the time, to the chamber, outlining a game plan to use what he called an activist-minded Supreme Court with a massive funded long-term strategy of corporations working together to do, do what he called transform the social, legal, and economic uh, landscape in America. That's exactly what they did. Lewis Powell wrote four decisions in six years that created the idea of corporate speakers, corporate speech. That didn't used to exist. That's a new theory under our Constitution. It's at the root of the Citizens United case, and it was created by a former chamber advisor who set out to do just that. So as a result, again, the consequences, laws struck down, and not just campaign finance laws, GMO labeling, genetically modified food, every democracy in the world, people have exercised their right to know and demanded labeling and gotten it, not ours. It's, a, it's illegal, a violation of the First Amendment, according to uh, the courts, to require labeling. The, Monsanto says it violates the corporate right not to speak if they don't want to. So we don't have labeling for food. Um, tobacco, updated cigarette warnings, struck down. Financial reform, struck down or under challenge. The right of employees to know, have a sign posted to protect their rights in the workplace, to discuss workplace conditions and decide for themselves whether to organize, struck down, violation of corporate rights. I could go on, don't worry, I won't. It's, we have seen the shrinking of our democracy. So what do we do? We do work on those reforms that we need to do. Um, the reason I said Michigan is in the front lines, Citizens United overturned a case called Austin versus Michigan Chamber of Commerce. We had won this fight in 1990. Uh, Justice Rehnquist, you know, again, hardly a, a flame-throwing leftist, a very conservative, appointed the same day as Lewis Powell. He dissented in all those cases that Lewis Powell said corporations have speech rights. He was writing dissents, and he was there in 1990 to work with Thurgood Marshall uh, on, on the more liberal side of the court to write a decision that upheld the right of people in Michigan to keep corporate money out of elections. We won this, Michigan Chamber of Commerce uh, versus Austin. Supreme Court said no, in Citizens United, that's wrong, doesn't count, overturned it, done. Um, so we gotta fight it again, but we're not gonna leave it to the lawyers. It's, it's too late for that, we have to get the people involved. The way we do that in America is the way we always have, the constitutional amendment process. It's the Amendment 28, because we've done this 27 times before. Um, they've all been really hard, uh, they've all been um, necessary though. And I'll just quickly run through just a, a few of them as a quick, you know, why we can do this, why we have no right to not work our, you know, what's off to get it done because our people before us did and we wouldn't have had our democracy that's now at stake if they hadn't. So, you know, Amendment 27, Supreme Court said women don't have the right to vote, overturned by a, by a constitutional amendment. Supreme Court said that young people under 21, even though they can be drafted and sent off to war, don't have a right to vote. Overturned, constitutional amendment. Supreme Court said we, Congress does not have the power to do a federal income tax. They sided with wealth, again, rather than democracy. Struck down the income tax, that was overturned with a constitutional amendment. Senators used to be appointed, as Theodore Roosevelt knew, by corrupt legislators, state legislators in corporate dominated Legislators, legislation, the people did a constitutional amendment to overturn that. So I, over and over, um, poll tax that kept equal voting rights uh, from being, being true, poll tax to keep poor and particularly African Americans away from the, the voting uh, booth struck down, uh, uh, no, upheld by a Supreme Court, overturned by a constitutional amendment. So we have always had the last word, we have to use this tool, and the good news is, it's working. We are winning this. So when I first, uh, the book first came out, uh, one state, Hawaii, had passed a 28th Amendment resolution calling for the overturn of Citizens United 
and the 28th Amendment to reaffirm that the Constitution is for people, not corporations, and that we can regulate spending in elections and other aspects to ensure political equality. I often wondered why Hawaii? Nobody had gone there or organized. And, and I was speaking in San Francisco a little while ago, and someone came up to me after when I said that in my talk, and they said, I can tell you why. Uh, the president of Hawaii, just before we became a state, was also the president of the Dole Corporation at the same time. We know what it's like to be governed by a corporation, and we don't want it. And, and it was almost as spontaneous. They knew what Citizens United meant immediately. Well, where are we now, two or three years later? Yeah. Two Six, thank you, I can do this in 90 seconds, but I'll take all my two minutes. 16 states have now enacted 28th Amendment resolutions. 600 cities and towns in meetings just like this. In New England, I don't know if you have these here. In New England, we have town meeting government, uh, where we, we the whole town meeting is the citizens of the town, amendment resolutions, debates about Citizens United, calling for the 20th Amendment to overturn it, have swept New England, 47 in New Hampshire in one week in March alone, 60 in Massachusetts, over in Vermont. These people are gathering, and it's not partisan, 80% plus margins of passage. I'm going to close with telling you what happened in Montana, uh, which was about the 13th state. Again, we're, we're up to 16 and growing. Montana had a law like Michigan's. It said no corporate money in elections. Went back to 1912. Um, like Michigan, they fought, and even after Citizens United, they fought all the way to the Supreme Court, saying we have a right as a state to keep our m corporate money out of state elections. The Supreme Court slapped them down. Summary reversal said, no, you don't. Um, again, five to four. So what happened? Did they just go home? No. Within weeks, 40,000 people in Montana had signed ballot initiative uh, uh, resolutions to put it on the ballot to condemn that decision, condemn Citizens United, and I think they do this out west, to not demand or ask, but instruct their politicians <laughs> to get the 28th Amendment out of Congress, get it ratified by the states. And I can talk at question time about what exactly the amendment would say. Um, there's different examples of that. But so what happened with this ballot initiative? It's on the ballot in Montana. We had Governor Schweitzer and the Lieutenant a Democrat stand side by side with a Republican to do a video saying that corporations are not people. We had faith leaders talking about corporations are not made in the image of God. We had ranchers, farmers, business people, everybody in Montana wanting this, fighting for it, pushing for it. So Montana voted for Mitt Romney in the election, easily 55-42, I think it was. They passed this 75% to 25%. Same day it passed in Colorado. Everywhere this is stood up where the people get to speak, we know what we want to do. We know what we need to do. We know we're a big fight that goes beyond economics, law, politics. It's about our destiny as a nation, and okay. it's so exciting to see Americans coming together to do this. So uh, I look forward to working with you and some questions. I'm getting the book. Thank you very so, much. Thank you. I'm going to uh, move this uh, microphone up to that stand. Uh, Jeff, can you come and take the sure. microphone up there? And we'll invite uh, people who have questions to come up to the microphone and ask them. And if, uh, if I feel that the question is not entirely clear, at least to my 80-plus year old mind, um, I'll uh, uh, ask Jeff. I'll first repeat it and then ask Jeff to uh, clarify. All right. Well, thank you. And um, I, I really enjoyed your book. And especially the part, the part that disturbs me so much is about Lewis Powell. And so I wanted, it, was there any precedent of other justices um, creating their own precedent and creating laws like that from the Supreme Court? And are there any safeguards? Is there anything, I mean, could this happen on any issue? Do we have to pass an amendment to stop every, you know, every every judge who has an agenda? Yeah. Um, so, Please. So everyone heard the question, I think, and yeah, um, you know, it's it's um, it's one of the reasons we have hearings uh, and we have, you know, a confirmation debate, and you want to know like what what are their thoughts because they have a lot of power. Uh, Lewis Powell was never asked about this memo because it's not disclosed. Uh, the Senate didn't know about it. 
it was it was kept secret essentially. So we never had that debate before he went on the court. I think you know Supreme Court justices, um, despite what Chief Justice Roberts said when he was confirmed that I want to be an umpire, I just call balls and strikes. Um, you know he had a. I think he wanted to change baseball into hockey or something. He had a, he had a very different agenda. And they often have strong agendas. Um, but you know the stakes are not usually so grave because they come and go. We have pushback. We have, you know, in a successful democracy, it's more dynamic and complicated. Um, so you know, it can happen on any issue, but we don't need amendments every time. Um, but I think at some point, when, the, when it goes so far and gets so ingrained as we now have with Citizens United basically completing Lewis Powell's work, um, it's up to the people to do something. So I'm not sure you could do a correction to screen out and have perfect judges, um, even on the Supreme Court. Um, the idea of different presidents appoint them, hopefully you get some. But you know, Brown versus Board of Education was nine to nothing. And it was very important to just the Chief Justice at the time, or a Warren, that it be like that, because he knew that the Supreme Court doesn't have power except by its respect that it gets from the American people. And I think Chief Justice Roberts is in grave danger of causing a crisis of legitimacy about the court itself. And that's usually more than one justice. It's when you repeatedly have 5-4, five, 5-4, four, five, four, five, four, split, sort of basically using power rather than reason. Um, that we have a problem. So thank Let's you for have the question. next question, then, please. Thank you. Recently, I saw a bumper sticker. It said, I'll believe corporations are people when Texas executes one. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know where I can get a, a bumper sticker? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'm sure you can find one online. Uh, Google. Uh, Do you have another like question? No, that's okay. Next person. Uh, May I ask you a question by just standing here well, rather than you, climbing over? Well, sure, I can repeat it. I can hear you. It's and a I very can. simple question. All right. When I speak to my friends, some of my friends, about this, about being dismayed by this Citizens United decision, they say, well, they're the unions. The unions have always given lots of money, and they don't have, you know, this is just compensating for the unions. Yeah. No. What's the simple answer to that? So um, the question, so everybody could hear it, um, what about unions? You know, people often hear that, the corporations are spending money. Well, that just levels the playing field, because unions spend a lot of money. So the answer is, as usual, there's no real short answer. But, the, but let's start with the truth. McCain-Feingold, the law that the court struck down, applied to unions and corporations. It was not, it applied to unions exactly the same way. That was true since Taft-Hartley, 1947, I think. So unions were already covered by the same law. Um, and so when Citizens United struck that down, unions are spending a lot of money too. And I think you know, the short answer is, if you want a, a, dip, a more you know, debate, it's, you can talk about the differences between unions and corporations, but they're great and they're grave differences. But the shortest answer is, no, well actually, that's not true. Unions were covered. But, and, and corporations, and we should have the right to decide in our democracy whether unions or corporations should be spending money. Our amendment, you know, we have some working people and unions that support what we're doing, and we tell them, look, we, we're going to win this, and we're going to be able to limit union spending in elections too. Just understand that. And they say, oh yeah, we get it. Democ we can't do anything without democracy. So we're not going to get support of a lot of Republicans if we don't speak honestly about you know, that this applies to unions too, as it should, and it did before. Um, you, so that's, that's the short answer. Jeff, that, I think there's another. Yeah? Oh, sorry, Doc. I think on that same topic, there's another point. Um, the, uh, some of the justices referred to the ability of shareholders to, um, to, to discipline. Uh, the CEOs or the uh, trust of the, the directors, board of directors. Um, the point is that uh, no shareholders, even if they disagree with how the CEO is spending money politically, no shareholder has the right to tell the CEO, don't use uh, any of the capital I put into your company. Right. In the case of unions, any union member can say, do not use the money I put into my dues for the particular political program 
that you're advocating. Yeah, and, isn't and that an important? It's a very important distinction, and it's um, you know the the uh, SEIU says in response to this debate, look, our our political money comes from janitors and, and our members giving six bucks a month if they choose, and and uh, if they if they don't want to, we can't make them. So it, that's a that is a big difference between billions of dollars. The shareholders basically have no control over. And Justice Kennedy and, and Chief Justice Roberts' answer is, well, you don't like it, sell your shares. You know, a very plutocratic <laughs> answer. So, um, yes, sir. You said in your talk that you wouldn't bother to say what the 28th Amendment would say if it come out of question. Thank you. Bless you. So the 28th Amendment, um, here's the good news. We are doing so well that a lot of people in Congress want their own amendment because they want to be a champion of something they know the people want. So, so we have a good problem. We have about 12 or 13 different versions of the 28th Amendment right now in the House and the Senate. If you go to freespeechforpeople.org, I know it's a mouthful, but that's the organization, freespeechforpeople.org, we have the exact text of the two amendments that we think get the job done and they can be combined. One deals with political equality. It says that it reestablishes what we've always had. The states and Congress, i.e. we the people through our representatives, can make fair election rules, including limiting spending, public financing, disclosure, whatever we need to ensure fair election rules so everybody gets to participate. That's number one. The second one overturns and restores the word people in person in the Constitution means human being not corporation. So those are the two pieces. There's variations on them. There's one that combines them. And that's okay at this stage. I mean, we are moving forward fast. There's growing consensus about what the right language is. Um, so again, this is a good problem that we have a lot of amendments. It'll work itself out. Meanwhile, the resolutions that we can enact, that you can enact right here in Ann Arbor, if you haven't already done it at the state level in Michigan, um, don't have to pick and choose among the amendment language. We have proposed resolutions on our website, and they establish the principles that we're talking about and call for a 28th Amendment to restore fair, free elections to the people. Um, and then that way, we enable the debate to continue while building the organization and the, the, the larger organization of all Americans who want to get this done and carry forward this debate without wordsmithing each of the different amendment pieces. So, thank you. Thank you. Oh, is there one last question, question in the back? Oh, that's he's saying thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. We are we're going to move at uh, at this moment into uh, a slightly different topic. Um, that topic is. Uh, what are the differences between corporations and human beings? Um, the reason I phrase this as a kind of uh, introductory topic is because uh, Robert Monks is going to talk about the functional differences between corporations and human beings uh, based on his experience as he was once the president of an oil and coal company and he was once the chairman of the board of uh, Boston Bank. He has experience uh, in the banking and the corporate world. Um, so uh, what he will be doing in talking about the functional differences between a corporation and a person sets the stage for what we're going to do tomorrow. Um, at the main library, which is to focus on uh, the difference between human moral values. I hear you, you get those I'll get it for you. Let me get it for you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We'll deal with the difference between um, human moral values and corporate behavior with special attention to three different corporations that now have or have had uh, presence in Ann Arbor. So if today the focus is on Citizens United uh, and its national consequences, uh, tomorrow's focus is on Ann Arbor as a community 
uh, or on other Michigan communities. And our focus uh, will be uh, taking the examples of three corporations, J.P. Morgan Chase, um, Pfizer, and the former Gelman Sciences, which became Paul Sciences. Um, uh, let me just say one word about uh, the way in which the discussion tomorrow uh, will be a little bit different from the rest of the hour here today. Um, I'm going to pick six different human moral values and uh, first uh, speak about them, uh, I hope, uh, clearly and provide definitions and show their origins. Many of the values that I will mention tomorrow um, are uh, uh, point to things that our bodies desire, uh, which we know now from recent findings in the cognitive sciences, in the biological sciences, and in psychological sciences. Um, so these are not uh, picked out of a hat but they are values that have a certain scientific backing for their existence. Um, and I want to tomorrow to show how each of the values is in conflict with the behavior of the corporations that we take as examples. Uh, for example, I'll mention only one now, which is shame. Uh, it usually goes in the set, respect, the desire for respect, and the avoidance of shame. Shame is a very human value. Um, I saw that in a recent review of Elizabeth Warren's new book, she said, um, the big banks can be too big to fail, but they don't feel shame if an individual house owner goes bankrupt. He or she feels great shame. Um, shame avoidance has been uh, a characteristic, at least, of the corporations that we investigate. Uh, they do it by never uh, being accountable. The idea of being responsible or accountable for policies and actions uh, does not generally appear. Uh, instead, they settle. They settle, which allows them not to accept any responsibility. Um, so uh, what, what happens is that the person, uh, the people who end up paying for the policies that pollute water and air uh, um, are certainly not, uh, the people who pay the fines are not the managers of the corporations who approved of the policies that did this. Uh, the people who pay are the shareholders and more extensively taxpayers. Okay, so that's what we're going to be doing tomorrow. But today, uh, Bob Monks is going to uh, deal with the functional differences. Let me just say another word about him. Bob Monks has had success um, where I guess some of us never expected it to be possible. When he uh, a number of years ago, at the time in which he accepted a position with the first Bush administration as head of the, in the Labor Department, the head of the nation's pension funds, uh, he realized that in the pension funds there was a huge, a huge amount of wealth throughout the country. I mean, trillions plus of wealth. But it was also the case that the managers almost never voted. They never filled in their proxies and voted. So he was able to uh, uh, get it understood that proxies are a form of assets and to get the rules passed that managers of these, um, inst these institutional investors are required uh, by law to vote. Now, you couldn't tell that while he was in his civil uh, government position, you couldn't tell uh, the pension funds, etc., for whom to vote. So as soon as he retired, he established institutional shareholder services. 
which provides uh, detailed information to the managers of pension funds, etc., as to how they should vote. So I hand this over to Bob Marks. <coughs> Let me see. I have to show my mechanical incompetence one thing at a time. <laughs> Let's see. This will work best. How's this? There's a problem with a big difference between my belt and the <laughs> How's this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Well, if you can't hear me, you still want it. Uh, you know, you know, raise your hand. Um, now, assuming I know how to work this, let's just get the embarrassment out of the way early. Well, I don't know how to work it. Who does? Uh oh, come back. Come back. Oh, good. Good. Well, I'll try to say something while we're getting help. Um, I do want. Again, I thank, the or I thank you all for coming. I said to myself, after a winter in Maine, if I had a night like this, I don't think I'd have come. <laughs> and um, you're a little ahead of us, but not too far. No leaves, get the suspicion of grass, but there it is. Um, so thank you very much for coming, and thank the organizers for the work they've done. But I particularly want to just say a word of my great good fortune in life, and that is that, it, oh, there we go. It's machine X. So which one? That turned it off. I told you it'd be embarrassing. <laughs> that is forward. Okay. Okay. I'm going to keep my thumb on this so there's no possibility here. But uh, tonight is a very special occasion for me because it's the culmination of 63 years of being stimulated inspired and mentored by Don Monroe. Huh. And thank you, Don. <laughs> All because some kind of lottery system. We were both transfer students in college. So you were, I showed up at the door. I had no idea what I was going to see on the other side of the door. Um, and I opened the door. I looked into the room on the right. And there was this very serious person sitting down, studying assiduously. And I must say, it's the same position he's in today. <laughs> so, so bless you, Don. Thank you. Uh, I want to call attention just very briefly to something that you all know. Things in this country are not the same as they were as recently as 30 years ago. There's, there, there are plainly things that are wrong. Um, the, the discrepancy of wealth, I suppose, is the most current present example of which we're all aware. There are that's a matter of common sense. You don't need polls, you don't need surveys, you know it. You know it every minute of every day. And in effect we're all diminished by knowing it and not doing anything about it. Well, why is this happening? And it is my view that this is happening because the voice of the corporation has become the language of public policy. And when people talk about corporate speech, it's really worth thinking about what are they talking about? How does a corporation speak? Does a fire hydrant speak? That, that was a long essay by a Harvard professor, very good, about hi fire hydrant speech. They don't have it, except to say no to the dogs. Um, <laughs> but, but, but how does a corporation speak? A corporation clearly does not speak. A corporation speaks through its agents. And the people who are agents of corporations, its executives, its public relations people, what have you, they do not speak as human beings. They speak as representatives of an enterprise whose behavior is severely circumscribed by law. A corporation is a profit-maximizing entity. People who speak in behalf of the corporation, are speaking in aid of the profits of that corporation. If they're not, they should be fired. Or if they're not, the corporation uh, shouldn't be there because that's what a corporation is. And so 
on the one hand, you have corporate speech. It isn't like someone saying, there's going to be, you know, you, me, all of us, and then Aunt GE, and we'll all have a vote. We'll all talk. Aunt GE talks differently than we do. Aunt, Aunt GE has a different level of constraints, and that's what I'm going to talk about. And I'm going to conclude with a really very sad example that was stimulated by what Jeff said in one of his wonderful comments, and, and that is, you know, almost everybody knows how to fix the election system. It's all there. We can't, we haven't been able to do it. And that, I think you'll see, is a good conclusion. Now, what I'm trying to do here, and I'll go through, uh, to have the virtue of Stephanie making some lovely slides, is, is to try and, and just make you understand how the last 30 years, say post Lewis Powell, was 71, 40 years, how the last 40 years have been different from what came before. <laughs> and in a sense, it, it, it can be... Just this is the organizing theme. It's human goals or corporate goals. And in the human goals category, you know, uh, you, you have a, a number of qualities, which Don is going to talk about more tomorrow. But I'm just going to put them up here so you can see, just, just by way of contrast. I mean, this is a very simple series of characteristics. Fairness, holism, cooperation, Pluralism of interest group. Now contrast that with corporate goals. Power and efficiency. Top down, not cooperative or, or collegially. Competition. Hegemony. Somebody's got to win. You can already see that there is a massive difference between what a corporate voice is saying and what a human voice is saying. And you can't expect over a period of 30 years when you have that difference in voice that it isn't going to affect the outcome. So the reason why we have inequality, perhaps the reason why we have war in Iraq, is attributable to a voice that is not a human voice. Listen, I've never heard of a human voice who knows why we want the war in Iraq. <laughs> now, what human goals health, survival, and well-being. Those words came from Donald Monroe f five years ago when I first started to think about this. Care for spiritual and emotional aspects of life, long-term. And then what do we have for corporate goals? If you think of what it means in a country that was characterized by the sentiments of by the people, for the people, of the people. Winner takes all, efficiency, material, short term. It's nothing to do with people. Now, what I am here to tell you today is this is why the country is different than it was 30 years ago. It's because this is the prevailing dominant language of public discourse. This is what is the result of what lobbyists do. Lobbyists are an aid of these goals that are different from human goals. Now, how about accountability? Now, individuals, human goals, principle-driven. Uh, these are sort of normal idea that, that we as human beings have a sense of what's right and what's wrong. I mean, as simple as that. It doesn't take a thousand word, you know, cost-benefit ratio analysis. <laughs> Holistic. Good <laughs> children. You know, we, we, we're, we're interested in the, long, in the longer term, in, in the wide way, the way it affects the world. If it's, it's good for us and bad for our children, we don't want to do it. Corporations don't do that. Internalize full impact of functioning. That is really a very important thing. Unfortunately, <coughs> corporations are profitable to the extent that they can make someone else pay for the costs of their operation. The simplest answer to that, and I can tell you from my home in Maine, is that I, this is about 40 years ago. I get there in the wintertime, and every once in a while I have a clear day, and it's just beautiful. I live right by the ocean. I open the door, I go out, pretty cold, but still you feel very invigorating. I go, ah, like that. And I go, oh. There was a sulfate paper plant about 12 miles there, and in the wintertime it's pretty cold, and it cuts across the air pretty quickly. And that was the end of going out of doors for that day. 
Um, well, that is an example of that I was paying part of the cost of producing that paper. And it's one of the more dramatic examples. And that is a positive object of corporate functioning, is to get someone else to pay the bills so that you have more profit. And it's very, and that's what lobbyists do, is to make sure that that stays the way it is. We try, as citizens, to figure a way of having our own values represented. And in this community, I think, Jeff, you'll see that Ann Arbor did pass a resolution about, um, I, think in, I think in 2012, Ann Arbor passed that resolution. So, so they're already there. So maybe they can lead your goal to, to, to get their Congress, congressional delegation to move it on. Corporate goals, resource depleting. Well, here's a question of external costs. I mean, what you take out today isn't there tomorrow. Take, for example, the Norwegian people. You know what they've done? They have said that all the money they get from taking oil out of the North Sea, they put into a fund for the benefit of the Norwegian people in the future. The reason being that the oil they take out now won't be available for their grandchildren. Oh, I hope it won't ever be used by their grandchildren. But at the moment, they are prepared to deny themselves immediate wealth by simply spending that money like guess who? <laughs> Sound familiar? The United States, the United Kingdom, every other country in the world. The Norwegians have taken the view that this is a matter of intergenerational fairness. They now have that little country, well, I think there are more Norwegians in, in Wisconsin than there are in Norway. And, 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 I, I think there are six million people in Norway. They got a trillion dollars. A trillion dollars is set aside for future generations of Norwegians. And how that money is invested is really important. That may be the critical investment money in the world. And that's, that's because um, you've got a, a government there that is said to, that hasn't been co-opted by the corporations and they're thinking long-term about their people. Rule-driven, unfortunately, I have to tell you as a reforming lawyer, um, rule-driven simply is, in, in the case of the relationship of corporations to society in America, rule-driven is simply a guidebook for how to get around something. I mean, how can you advise your client that they can legally do something that is plainly contrary to the intent of the statute? <laughs> Corporate goals, externalized costs. Yeah, I've mentioned that. Cost-benefit calculation. There is now, and since 1980, since Ronald Reagan was president, believe it or not, yeah, he said you have to have a cost-benefit calculation before any law is allowed to go into effect or before the president will sign it. Cost-benefit is based on the assumption, first, that we know that there are factors that actually predict the impact of something, which I've had a lot of bad experience with myself. I don't think that's true. And the second thing is, it simply says you don't have legislators who talk to their constituents. You don't have people who think. You don't have people who feel and say, is this a good idea? So we're getting columns of figures, all of which we're told in multiple volumes, prove that it's beneficial. And at the same time, you know in your heart it's wrong. And so that's, that's why these corporate goals, they've found a language that legitimates what they're doing. Now, to whom are, are corporations and people accountable? Well, I'm accountable to my wife. <laughs> Society as a whole, the idea of internalizing the full impact, citizens, the whole concept of citizenship, and personal accountability. Now, how about corporations? No personal responsibility. They're responsible to the marketplace. Now, how often have you heard everybody tell you, whatever you say to somebody, this is a very bad idea, and say, oh, look, let, let the marketplace determine it. The marketplace tells you what's right. Well, you know, it's as if the marketplace were some marvelous concept that exists through a whole series of innocent inputs and produces a reputable answer. In fact, if, if you're thinking about marketplaces, and just look at the banks, look at the short-term markets for the overnight funds. Every bloody bank in the world is cheated. And I have to say that that's probably a pretty good prediction as to what the marketplace is. And, and yet that's what we're told is supposed to be the guide for people's conduct. 
resource depleting again. And corporations are responsible basically to their shareholders to make a profit. On occasion, they're, oh, it's a somewhat wider constituency because they pay their bills to the town, to their employees and what have you. But basically, it's a limited constituency. It's not society as a whole. So what I want to, to pose to you is this. The biggest expense in running for office is paying for television. It's overwhelmingly the biggest expense. And so in a funny way, you have all this money being raised from people that just goes right into the television stations. And the television stations make enormous profits out of this because they have no production costs. People, the candidates pay the production costs, they pay a fee. There's some kind of notion that they might limit how much they can charge for it. But you know, in times like uh, the last election when there was so much money, um, and these prices are up, 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 and this is the profit of those entities. Now, Two minutes. Now you mentioned, Mc I will, I'll be there. You mentioned McCain-Feingold. Now John McCain, uh, who is, is, is a unique American person. I mean, I've got to tell you, he's flaws and all. He's really quite a guy. McCain put into that bill something that makes all the sense in the world. The airwaves in which they put television signal belong to the people. Elections are the unique province of the people. We should require that, the, it, as a condition of getting their license to use the airwaves that belong to all of us, that these television, radio, what have you stations will agree to make available given blocks of television time at, in, in connection with the election <coughs> process. And that then enables the government to say, we will make available to the candidates for president each $100 million worth of television time if they will agree not to raise money from anybody else. Now, I have to tell you, I've never met anybody running for office who likes raising money. And if you give people the opportunity to have free television time in exchange for an absolute mandate to spend no other money, that has gone a long ways towards solving our problem. But McCain told me, he said he had that in his bill. And guess what? It never even got considered because the power of the communications companies was so great the, 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 a, a perfectly sensible, common, sensible thing to try for campaign reform. We can't even get it listed because of corporate power. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, I don't want to trip people, and I've got a big voice. What I want to say is that I'm retired from local government. Please, when you listen to government discussions and they say, why can't you run it like a business, will you remember what Mr. Monk said? We are not in the business of profit. Our shareholders are the people. And we are not at all interested in running our government, or at least the county commission where I serve, like a business. Oh, sir. Very nice talk. Thank you. Um, and I am a naturalized citizen. About 40 years ago, I took the oath for my adopted country. And you are right. I think every day it's not the same as it was when I took that oath. Mm -hmm. But that's neither here nor there. No, it's very important. I mean, I don't, I don't think many people realize that. I mean, I mean, Louis Brandeis is one of the great, great people in American history. Uh, he said in 1933, he said, people of this generation operate under the assumption that they were, it was always this way, that there always was corporate power. He said that is not the way it always was. And now here we are, what, 80 years later. And, and I was a corporate so uh, I want to disclose that. <laughs> but, but my question is, how do you change this culture? I mean, it has happened over the 40 years. How, what action do we take to turn that around and make our legislators more responsible to people? I mean, I know democracy has been hijacked in this country. 
with citizens, you know, united. Yes, it's been challenging. How, how do you do you have some talk? I think I think that we had the great privilege today of, of, of hearing from a very courageous man, Jeff, because what he's doing is the beginning of the answer. You know, there is no third party. There is who is going to take care of this. There is no omniscient law that we can. That's not a very good use of the English language. Excuse me. But there is no, you know, all wise law that we can we, we can enact if we think hard enough. Change has to come about through the engagement of the citizens in a process of reclaiming their rights. And that's what Jeff's trying to do. That's what it's all about. So this is an opportunity. And you know what's the old Chinese thing? Danger and opportunity. Is that right, Don? Danger and opportunity, I think. <laughs> uh, um, and, and so, so this crisis has gotten bad enough that hopefully many people will share like you. And you know, you like me. I mean, I'm also an immigrant to the country. It was a couple of hundred years earlier, but there it is. We're all immigrants. <laughs> and, and, but the nice thing about that, it's our country. We can make of it what we want, and bad on us if we don't. Right. Question over there. Yes. Um, I worked for a public corporation for two and a half weeks only because I gave them two weeks' notice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that, that, that's my brush with that. But, and I appreciate you folks framing a lot of my, my thoughts uh, into tangible perspectives. Uh, I, I really do. One thing that, I, that and I, I grew up about four hours south of here, so I've only been here a few years. I, I, I bought property when I took a position up here, and that's a sentence up here. It's not funny, I know, but <laughs> that's why I'm still here. But anyway, one of the things that I see is there's also, um, we are 40 minutes away, 40 minutes west of one of the greatest examples of the corruption of what you're speaking, is my question. I believe that's the case. I believe the Industrial Revolution was the genesis of, of much of this, and it put this, what, what, the, what that allowed everyone to do is put this veil of okayness by paying these wages, which is about, I'm asking you to tell me I'm nuts, maybe, uh, that, that that's not the case. No, I, I think, I, I don't think you're nuts. I think the problem is, you know, what we're talking about is pretty simple. It's a question of power. And wages being nuts was a question of there being an asymmetry of power. And so excessive power produced a unsustainable result with the consequences we, we were seeing. Now, the problem, of course, with the country is when you get corporate power there, um, there's an asymmetry between corporate power and the rest of us. Now, through efforts like Jeff, we, we, we as citizens still have rights that we can do if we, people will, will simply understand that it's available to us, but it isn't going to be given to us by anybody else. We've got to get it. I, mean, I think there, I mean, there are a lot of people in America who have been able to get a better position by virtue of insisting on the integrity of themselves. I mean, after Brown versus the Board of Education, the progress has been great. Not good enough, but great. The gay community has done an incredibly good job about moving their position in, in the world to something that's now overwhelmingly accepted by, by people. Now, that is, we haven't got an issue that we, we haven't found the right way to make people feel that the issue at stake here is every bit as important as the right for gay marriages to gay people and the right for equal rights was for non-Caucasian Americans. Thanks. Uh, the uh, city of New York had a recent change of financing for elections, and they now have a procedure by which for every dollar given by a resident, the city adds some money to it. Of course, the corporations put out things. But the underlying problem is to convince members of Congress and voters in enough states that we, uh, we want can't we some can't action. Hear so the, 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 give it a The underlying problem is to convince both members of Congress. Why don't you go back to the beginning so everybody can hear? Yeah. New, in New York. Yeah. In New York. Yeah, New York has a recently enacted a law which essentially says for every dollar a citizen gives, the city gives a larger amount of money for that particular candidate. Uh, that's a form of financing elections. Uh, and uh, the, what I want to really get to, however, is the following. In order to convince either Congress to act or the 
the state legislatures to act in enough enough states or vote be held in enough states that we need to uh, have one very important step. We need to have votes taken by individuals in many, many, many communities, especially Republican communities, showing that the citizens of that community want a change in Citizens United. So we need to we need to get so what, is the many what is the question? Are, are you active in getting voters in many communities to have votes on this subject? Um, Bob is saying to me the mic. <laughs> well, I, uh, I, I hand him the mic because I wanted to know. We used to have a law like that in Maine, and it got declared unconstitutional. Yeah. So, so, so I wonder what New York City knows that we don't probably have lost it. On the other hand, uh, we used to have a fair election law with that. you back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, 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 now I know why you passed me the mic. I guess. Uh, so yeah, it's a really important point that public funding of elections, we fund our roads, we fund our schools, we fund the things that belong to all of us. And I think the dismantling of elections as a civic place reflects in a sad way exactly what Bob has described as the capture of our country, the transformation of that civic space to a marketplace um, where those with more money. And so the New York example, and um, Bob is reminding me that Maine, where he's from, um, has a public funding of elections mechanism as well. And it's, a, it's a, a, an excellent idea. You can opt in and take the public money, and that means you don't take the private money. And um, in, eight, in Maine, a few years ago, 80% of the candidates Republicans, Democrats opted in, and they had to get $5, $10 contributions, so it forced the candidates to go to ordinary citizens to say, you know, I need 10 bucks, here's what I'm going to do, and have conversations. That got struck down in a case called Arizona Free Enterprise, um, after Citizens United, before McCutcheon, it's part of the Roberts Court dismantling of our elections, of our public government. And the reason he said, in another five to four decision, is that violates the free speech rights of the rich people because it had a triggering mechanism so that if there was a huge, you know, multi-million dollar contribution to a candidate, that triggered a balance, not that much, just a little bit of extra for the public candidate, so the public would at least hear all the candidates, that got struck down. So after Citizens United, when you have unlimited spending, it's great New York's trying, New Maine's trying, um, but it's very hard to have an effective public financing mechanism because it just gets like the rest of our voices buried by the unlimited funding from corporations. Um, so the votes in the, each of these towns and cities that you asked about is really essential because that, unless we change that power dynamic, that cultural mm -hmm. problem that Bob describes, and we claim our public space, we won't win this. So. Ann Arbor, I'm glad to hear, is one of the towns that have uh, cities that have had a vote. 600 and spreading like wildfire. So spread the word. Thanks very much. Uh, question? Stay, yeah. here, stay here. Stay here. Stay here. Okay. Stay there. Okay. Uh, this is probably a question for both of you. Um, but I'm going back, I think, to Mr. Monk's comment about the. I'm Bob. <laughs> about the individual level, the relationship between the individual, all of us in this room and everybody in the country, how it is that we haven't been able to frame right the, the importance of this issue for people. And I was thinking that it seems to me that this change that you've described over the past 40 years also coincides with the period through which regular individuals, maybe upper class, middle upper class, have gotten invested in the stock market on an individual level, either through their own buying of stocks or through their in investment retirement funds. I don't remember that being the case, not that I was alive that much longer than that before, but, but it seems to me that that's, been, that's grown hugely, the number of just sort of regular people who are invested so the in question, public companies. Madam. So the question is, does that psychologically play a role in how accountable people have been willing to hold companies that they themselves profit from the profit of. We're we'll talking about terrible English, but if if I, if my own dividends come from J.P. Morgan and depend on its profits, how willing am I, or motivated am I, going to be to 
do something that will hurt J.P. Morgan's profits? Well, you that's know, my question. It's a, it's a well, sort of on the end of it. I forget who said it, but it was somebody less famous than Lincoln. The Lincoln might have said it. But you know, ownership has responsibility. If you own J.P. Morgan stock, you own J.P. Morgan stock. You have responsibility. If a horse dies, you got to bury it. Now, in every other imaginable way, when you own property, we understand that people are responsible. The problem is the ethic does not make people feel responsible for owning shares in the company. That's the problem. I, I, I wonder, too, about the premise. I'm not sure that we are all as invested in the corporate America as, uh, as the impression that we're given. <laughs> Um, I don't. I think most. I'd like. I would like we to know. We are pension funds. Through, through yeah. No. Pension funds. A lot of people are. Invested. Right. But I, but is there? But I, I leave it as an open question. How much people are willing to um, turn off their moral compass because they're seeing the dividends? Because I think in the mutual funds and the pension funds, you're not necessarily aware even of which companies your retirement is in. Right. Uh, just one. Just one comment on on the role of the stock market. Uh, going popular. Uh, I think the emergence of the 724 uh, uh, stock news on the yeah. channels uh, probably helps push the short term, the word short in short term interest of the CEOs because their shareholders watch those news programs that didn't previously exist and uh, probably are pushing for short-term profits uh, based on what they see on the TV. Yeah. So, it, it, excuse me, it's not Mandrake the Magician. You know, it's not black magic. Whatever happens, happens because somebody's going to get a fee. It's as simple as that. News that creates somebody wants to buy and somebody wants to sell, that's why we have the news. I mean, that's why Warren Buffett is, not, is a great American. He doesn't buy or sell. <laughs> but, but most of the stuff is generated by brokers who just want to make people buy and sell. Um, you know, 99% of the research done says everybody would be better off if they just bought and held. But it, the bro except for the brokers. My question is, in these uh, uh, 28th Amendment proposals, uh, do any of them mercifully limit the time period in which you can conduct a campaign as they do in England? <laughs> and why not if they don't? Uh, that's right. So it sounds like there's some support for that. Uh, the 28th Amendment actually does not have that language, nor does it have a lot of the good ideas. Um, and the reason for that is because the Constitution is really about power, who has it, who doesn't. That's the struggle. That's why the fight for equality of power and participation is usually very simple. It's usually about, you know, shall not discriminate on account of race, shall not, you know, be deprived of voting on account of gender. They're very simple propositions. The complicated, you know, regulation of spending in elections or how long a period of an election, all of those things um, is through the laws that we would enact and would need to enact after the 28th Amendment restores our power to do so. So there's a lot of good ideas that we'll have to debate and decide and enact, but the amendment itself doesn't have that level of detail. We have time for one more question before we go to our final subject. Yes? Um, you've told us a little bit about why we can be optimistic and why we're going to wait. Bill Donahue is coming to you. <laughs> <laughs> Could you tell us that story again in a little more detail, how we win? Okay. Um, so how, you can see why he does this, it's kind of fun. <laughs> um, so how do we win this? Um, well, we don't underestimate its difficulty. Um, you know, this is, you need two thirds of Congress to vote out an amendment, then it has to be ratified by three quarters of the states. Um, and uh, that's under Article 5 of the Constitution. There's another method under Article 5, a constitutional convention can be called by three quarters of the states. Those are the two means. Um, now, the way we win, number one, is believe we can do it, because if you don't believe, you don't get up, you don't write that letter to the editor, you don't call a friend, you don't raise a resolution in your house of worship, uh, there we go, uh, house of worship or any other gathering of people, you don't call your legislature to say, have you sponsored the amendment resolution yet? But if you believe we can do this, you do those things, and millions of Americans do those things. And that's what the resolution process is enabling. 
So when we had the ballot initiative in Montana, and I say we, it's a lot of people, a lot of groups, it's not just free speech for people, a lot of people, just like you and many of you, I'm sure, are doing this too. It gives a, it, start, it takes this vicious circle that has destroyed our democracy and incapacitated us, made us feel like it's hopeless, and it starts turning it into a virtuous circle. You just have a debate where you, you know, you're told that we're divided, we're hopelessly divided, we, you know, we can't do anything anymore, and then you see you know, that crazy conservative or that crazy liberal actually agrees with you, and you know, your, your, your fellow American is actually capable of powerful patriotic action, and then it, that leads to another circle, and people do it, and that's why it's gone explosively, if you think about it, from zero to 16 states, 600 cities and towns, and there's that, and let me just tell you the, the, where we stand in Congress. We need two-thirds. Um, nobody would talk to us in Washington three years ago. Um, and then, yeah, right, go smoke some more wherever you got that idea from and then send us on our way. Um, and then now, because of these resolutions, because uh, you know, the American people didn't get the memo that we can't do this, we don't do amendments anymore, they're actually doing it, Congress is paying attention. So we have over 130 members of Congress who are co-sponsoring amendment, amendment bills itself. That's more than a third, and more than two-thirds of the way to the two-thirds of Congress that we need. We're now up to 35 senators, so we need 66, right? So we're 35, that's more than halfway to the number of senators we need to co-sponsor this. And that's just by breaking out this movement across you know, 600 cities and towns, 16 states. We keep doing this. Um, they will either have to say, no, I defend Citizens United, and they will lose the next election, I guarantee you, if you smoke them out, because Americans everywhere don't like this decision, or they'll get on board and do this amendment. So, you know, we'll do the impossible, just like it was impossible that an all-male Senate would vote two-thirds to give women the right to vote, the 19th Amendment, or an all-male, uh, unelected uh, Senate would to support a constitutional amendment by two-thirds, to have people be able to run against them. All of our amendments were impossible until they were done. So believe, take an action, do something, and the virtuous circle will keep going and we'll reclaim our democracy. Well said. Well said. So now we, uh, we are already into the final topic. Um, which, I'll stand over here. The final topic, which is, uh, what can you do? What can I do? Uh, and I think there are short-term and long-term answers to that. Uh, in the short term, one of the things you can do is to join one of the organi organizations that uh, actively, with other people, is pursuing the matter and their strength in numbers. And one of those organizations is um, Stuart Dowdy, are you here? Stuart Dowdy? Stuart Dowdy's organization called Reclaim Our American Democracy, um, which has roughly 300 members. Um, and uh, even though only a few of them show up to, uh, maybe 15 show up to the monthly <coughs> meetings, um, but uh, it has the power of uh, the strength of numbers. Um, and um, so there's literature up on the table there about how you can join up with that. Then you could join up with uh, Jeff Clements, uh, Free Speech for People. Uh, somewhere here we've got the, uh, the email address for that. Um, and then there is a third one called, which is unfamiliar to us, to many of us, which is rootstrikers.org. This was founded by uh, the uh, gospel uh, speaker for public elections, public finance elections. His name is Lawrence Lessig. He's a professor at Harvard. And he wrote a book called Republic Lost, which if you're interested in familiarizing yourself with these matters, it's a fine uh, book to read. Um, now, a second thing that you can do in the short term is take note of this. Uh, I'm, uh, I don't know how many of you noticed, but the Supreme Court, the Roberts Court, uh, left standing uh, 
the legality of um, disclosure of donors. In other words, if you can get uh, the state, I mean the uh, the federal legislature to vote in favor of um, no in transparency of donors to the various super PACs and other such organizations, uh, the Supreme Court has said that it would not overrule that. Uh, that's probably unlikely at this moment in our uh, federal leg legislature, but at the state level, there is some activity. There are actually a couple of bills before the state house right now on uh, disclosure. Uh, this is a matter that Governor Snyder himself uh, backed away from in his, early in his uh, political career. He was in favor of it, uh, but he reversed himself and now uh, is against full disclosure. But one can work for, uh, for disclosure of uh, people who give the dark money, uh, the secret money, uh, and how do you do that? Well, you just get in touch with your state representatives who have, uh, have written the bills. One of them Jeff, is Jeff Irwin, uh, who is the author of one of these bills. Um, so, uh, so state legislatures, uh, affecting the state legislature is one thing that we can, one can gradually try to work on. Uh, then in the, uh, in the long term, uh, I would say advocate for public financing of elections. Um, when, you, um, when you have candidates uh, up for election, ask them how they feel about public financing and ask them how they feel about Citizens United and vote accordingly. And finally, um, there are um, things that the media can do. One of them, uh, which was first expressed um, in a very clear manner at a convocation run by uh, Stuart Dowdy's uh, road organization, which is to encourage the, the media to hire more investigative reporters because the people who discovered uh, the fraudulent criminal behavior by many of the corporations are investigative reporters whose numbers probably have been shaved uh, recently. Um, and, um, let's see. Oh yes, I, I guess I would uh, ask anybody who is connected with uh, an outfit that encourages corporations to come to Ann Arbor by offering tax incentives and so forth, ask them to uh, take a look at what the social and environmental impacts of the corporations have been prior to their coming here and make those considerations equally as important as the economic solidity of the corporations. But now uh, I'd like to hear from anyone else who has a question or comment about what can you do um, Anyone else? Yes. Yes. Here. Thank you. To uh, continue from the point I stated earlier, uh, we have already had resolutions in the city of Ann Arbor and the city of Ypsilanti, um, and we are trying to get the resolution in the city of Salina um, have an amendment. Uh, how many of you live in a town or a village or a township within Washtenaw County, uh, other than the ones I just mentioned, and can approach members of your township, town or city council and ask for such a resolution and organize a group to go with you to make that request. It was surprisingly easy to convince the city of Ann Arbor to do this. So. Uh, work on the premise that you could succeed. It's most important that you succeed in the townships which have basically Republican councils. Thank you. 
Any other thing? Yes. Uh, yes, sir. It's kind of a question. We all belong to, uh, in one fashion or another, many of us belong to a trade association. Uh, my, my question really is, is where do they fall between corporate and personal in regards to your amendment? In other words, uh, the National Fire Protection Agency. And there, there's so many things being done. And I don't pick on them. I'm just saying that there's, there's many of us in our work we're, we're involved in some way with the trade association. Yeah. Um, so uh, it's very important, I think, that um, we engage uh, that we engage in our amendment effort with the business people um, and through trade associations, uh, many other areas. Um, and I think the question is, is it depends on which one. Um, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce has spent a billion dollars on lobbying uh, since 1998. I don't think they are going to be in favor of our amendment resolution. But the American Sustainable Business Council is, it's a trade association, in uh, Montana and elsewhere, we got business groups to support us. We had the American Independent Business Alliance on our brief when we went to the Supreme Court. And so I think engaging the conversation in your association about, you know, first on a human level, like where do you folks stand on Citizens United and, you know, can we do something about this? That Because it's not a level playing field. It favors big global corporations. It doesn't favor Main Street businesses. Um, My question yeah. is, are, are they going to be part of this 28th Amendment where they would be excluded from being able to contribute? Well, again, no, it, it depends. This 28th Amendment gives we the people the authority to make the rules for our elections. If we the people decide, you know what, trade associations are fine, they have their place, but they shouldn't be spending mon business money in our elections and pass a law to that effect, yes, they'd be bound by that. Um, just like, you know, we're all bound by the law. So, um, you know, again, it's, if, if they would rather have a lobbyist than a democracy, they're not going to support this. But if they want a democracy and think that their trade can do just fine in a functioning democracy, they've got to be willing to live with the rules that the people might enact when we have our power back to do so. We've got time for two more questions. Yes, in the back there. Okay. I think the approach should be bottom up, not top down. You know, so talk to people who are involved and then have them go to the okay. What is your question? Yeah. No, not question. I'm, I'm making comment. Yeah. Comment is it should be, to answer to that gentleman, it should be bottom up. You start the gra at the grassroots and then go to your trade association or who are running the trade or whatever. In my opinion. That's the only way it's going to work. Otherwise, if you go to them, then they have set mind, they might as well use their lobbies and whatnot. And I get Do you want to comment on that? Uh, other than I agree now. <laughs> I, I do agree. It's an important point. Um, I. Uh, you're, you just this is your first visit to Michigan. Maybe you don't know that our House is controlled by Republicans and our Senate is controlled by Republicans. We have a Republican governor. We have a Republican Supreme Court, which has shown itself to lack, you know, basic democratic, basic, my turn, basic democratic values. And uh, so we have kind of a problem. We have kind of a problem, and uh, um, our party system is is. I'm sure this is not news to anybody, is sort of rigged so only two parties can really work. Um, what is your opinion about um, you know, trying to reinvigorate the Democratic Party? Because it seems to be rather hollow right now at the grassroots level about trying to get people into the party and make it do what we need. Everybody hear that? I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, so everyone heard that. Well, is that possible? Is that a waste of time? Um, What's your well, it's, it, I, I, I would um, say that I'm not going to do that um, because uh, I think it's so important, this cross-partisan. We don't win if we don't get an American consensus that prevails at some point. We need three-quarters, two-thirds of the American people. We have that now. So um, I think both parties need to be uh, much more responsive to the interests of Americans. Um, and the Democrats have their job to do, the Republicans have their job to do, 
Uh, maybe our whole system has a job to do of opening up to other ideas besides the two-party duopoly um, in some ways. Um, but I personally am joining with many others, I think, who are saying, you know, the sort of game theory of partisan politics is broken. Um, and neither party will be an avenue towards getting us out of this box, that we have to find a way to, um, probably it won't happen in Washington first, it'll be like in Montana, where you had Republicans, Democrats stand together to say, we don't agree on much, but we agree on this. And then I think when we have an effective democracy, both parties will get more vibrant, stronger, at talking about real issues rather than just um, and, we, and, and actually enacting and, and maybe even learning to compromise and get some, something done that is actually in the interest of the people and the public rather than um, their funders or their constituencies. So, you know, there are, I think there are movements in both parties. I think there's a vibrant sort of populist conservative movement that's pushing uh, the chambers now spending money against Tea Party candidates. Um, and I think there's a, a vibrancy sometimes reflected by people like Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren on the other side. And I think they're both about, you know, let's get the American people back into this process. So that's what I'm interested in. And I think I, I want to work, and I hope you do too, on how do we win as Americans together uh, to get this done, because otherwise we can't. Thank you. Thanks. I think that uh, that, that uh, ends our evening. Uh, we're right on target for the time we were allotted by the library and the fire department. <laughs>